Okay, gentlemen, we're going to begin. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful to be together studying the Word of God. We thank you for the privilege of having access to your Holy Word. And as we wrap up our wonderful study, I know we miss it already, Lord, the thought of not being together every Monday, but we know we'll come back together after Easter, and so may we make the most of this hour as we study this 13th chapter, and may you speak to us about Christian ethics, Christian living, and the reality that you, Jesus, live in us in the hope of glory. You who are the same yesterday, today, and forever, in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Right. Chapter 13, we almost made it to the end. This has been an amazing experience in the study of Christian doctrine. If you haven't realized it by now, we've been studying doctrine. Yep. And doctrine is pivotal if we're to understand how to live practically as Christians. Mm -hmm. So we will go through chapter 13 tonight. Uh, before I do that, I'd like to read a bit of church history to you, just to give us a perspective of what the early Christians acted like publicly. Uh, there was a governor named Pliny the Younger. He had an uncle named Pliny the Elder who was also found in history. And when Pliny the Younger, who was the lawyer and the governor of a town called Bithynia in Asia Minor, examined the Christians, he was to report back to the Roman Emperor Trajan to accuse the Christians, to tell them what they were up to. But he had to admit he couldn't find anything to condemn them about. And he wrote, quote, They bound themselves by an oath not to any criminal ends, but to avoid theft or robbery or adultery, never to break their word, or repudiate a deposit when called on to refund it. They do not commit crimes, and they pay their debts. Here are some commentary notes from MacArthur. If you have been with us in our study of Hebrews so far, you have become very aware of something that is important. For the first 11 chapters, there is not one single specific command given to a Christian. Not one. There is no practical explanation of anything for 11 whole chapters. The only exhortation in those 11 chapters is the warnings to those on the edge of Christianity to come all the way to Christ. The rest is just pure doctrine, pure theology. If you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, don't try to live the Christian life without Christ. You can't do it. And don't try to follow God's standards without God. It doesn't work. Everything we've read about leads us to the practical application of what the Hebrews were taught doctrinally. And so chapter 13 shows us how to live. All right, Vito, if you would please read the context and the keys to the text, which are found in the study guide, beginning on page 119. The world, said Alexander McLaren, takes this notion of God, most of all from those who say they belong to God's family. They read, it, they read us a great deal more than they read the Bible. They see us, they only hear about Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, throughout the history of the church, the often mean, prejudiced, and immoral lives of professed Christians have given the world a ready excuse to malign the claims of Christ. Perhaps this phenomenon explains the rationale of Hebrews 13. Most of Hebrews does not emphasize specific commands to Christians. This is an obvious lack of practical, or there is an obvious lack of practical explanation or exhortations. The bulk of the book is pure doctrine and is almost entirely directed to the Jews who received the gospel, or to Jews who received the gospel but who needed to be affirmed in the superiority of the new covenant. But in the last chapter, the writer gets practical. This fits the pattern of the New Testament teaching, which is always doctrine and then duty, beliefs, then behavior, position, and then practice. Chapter 13 is not an afterthought. It is integral to the message of this book. A pure faith demands a pure life. As you read, look for some of the essential ethics of Christian behavior <coughs> that will portray the true gospel to the world, encourage men to trust in Christ, and bring glory to God. If I could just interject something before you get to the keys to the text. What this is essentially saying is, don't lecture the world as it were, those who are not living a conscious Christian life in behavior. Because really, first you need to come to Christ and be transformed, and then your behavior will flow from that. To try to legislate morality by rules without an authentic spiritual awakening doesn't work. Maybe we've been there. And that's the point of that. So. Yeah, it was saying, don't uh, like do what they say, not as I do. Or do. <coughs> Keys to the con to the text. Contentment. This Greek word means self-sufficiency, 
The Stoic philosophers used it to describe a person who is unflappable and unmoved by external circumstances. Christians are to be satisfied and sufficient and not to seek for more than what God has already given them. He is the source of true contentment. 2 Corinthians 3, 5, 9, 8, Philemon 4, 11 through 13 and 19. Murmuring reveals dissatisfaction with God's sovereign, God's sovereign will for our lives and the lives of others and is a sin that he does not take lightly, even in the view of his grace. Complaining dishonors our Heavenly Father. Contentment glorifies Him. We daily benefit from the goodness of God's love. He gives us richly all things to enjoy, 1 Timothy 6.17. More than that, His love is shed abroad in our own hearts, Romans 5.5. 5. There is no greater source of comfort, no more, found, no more sure foundation for our security, no richer source of contentment. Sacrifice of praise. As seen throughout the book of Hebrews, sacrifices were extremely important under the Old Covenant. Under the New Covenant, God desires the praise and thanksgiving of his people, rather than the offerings of animals or grain. Yet the sacrifice, sacrifices of praise coming from the lips of God's people will only please him when accompanied by a loving action. Thank you, Nita. Okay, without any further ado, David Pinto, if you read for us, Chapter 13, starting on page 120, which goes all the way to 123, and there's no need to read any of the margin notes. Sounds good. Okay, Hebrews 13, 1 through 25. This is the New King James Version. Let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Remember the prisoners as if chained with, chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines, for it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat, for the bodies of the animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him, outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Obey those who rule over you, who rule over you, and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls, as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Pray for us, for we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things desiring to live honorably. But I especially urge you to do this, that I may be restored <clears throat> to you the sooner. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And I appeal to you, brethren, bear with the word of exhortation, for I have written to you in few words. Know that our brother Timothy has been set free, with whom I shall see you if he comes shortly. Greet all those who rule over you, and all the saints. Those from Italy greet you. Grace be with you all. Amen. Thank you, David. All right, let's begin. Verse 1. Let brotherly love continue. If you heard my sermon yesterday, you heard me talk about the four different words for love in the New Testament. Uh, this is... Phileo, which is brotherly love, different from agape, which is divine love is a gift from God, one of the fruits of the Spirit. And so the word literally is Philadelphia, brotherly love. So 
that's what it would look like if you read the original Greek. Brotherly love. Now last week I had Adam read Psalm 133, which is the Hebrew vision of true unity among people. And if you read it again, and really focus on the words, and imagine the oil running down the beard of Aaron. Remember last week I talked about when Aaron and other high priests were anointed, a big vat of oil would be poured over them and would run down. A holy mess. Just a sign of abundance. The kind of abundance you couldn't easily remove. You couldn't just like wipe it off or wash it in the washing machine. But the high priest would carry around the sign of his anointing throughout his ministry. Just this incredible abundance. Just a sign of how God is pouring out his favor. But it's tied into us getting along. Okay. How good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down upon the collar of his robes. It is, it is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even now <coughs> forevermore. So it's, it points to life forevermore. When we get along and love each other, it points to eternity. Mm -hmm. And notice it says, not let, let brotherly love begin, it says continue. So he's assuming that they're in unity, and may it continue. And Jesus spoke about this when he said, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So when we go back to Pliny the Younger, the lawyer who was writing to the Roman emperor in the first century, he was noticing how they were loving each other. It was noteworthy, because in that culture that was not the case normally. So let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some have unwittedly entertained angels. We have a bunch of uh, chestnuts in here, some scriptures you've probably heard just taken as a verse. Uh, that's the first one I think of tonight. I'll read that again. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Well, we're back to angels. Remember the first chapter. Jesus is superior to angels. Uh, but that certainly doesn't denigrate angels. It just puts them in their proper context. So what does it mean to entertain strangers who might be angels? Well, I think this is an allusion to the Old Testament. Because remember, this writer was a scholar. He knew the scriptures very well and brought them in. And he assumed his readers would know the scriptures. So Adam, once again, if you read for us Genesis 18, 1 to 15. <clears throat> the three visitors. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre, while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw the three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, If I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me, get you some, let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed and then go on your way now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered. Do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, get three seahs of fine flour and knead it to, break some, to bake some bread. Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to the servant who hurried to prepare it. He then brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set these before them while they ate, he stood near, near them under a tree. Where is your wife Sarah, they asked him. There, in the tent, he said. Then the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already old and well advanced in years, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah left. To hear her to he, to herself as she thought, after I am worn out and my master is old, now I will have this pleasure. Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, Yes, you did laugh. <laughs> Thank you. So we have three visitors. And the visitor calls himself the Lord. What do you make of that? Holy Trinity. 
Some have said so. There's a Greek icon that's pretty famous which shows three identical individuals in front of Abraham's tent. And that's the icon of the Holy Trinity. <coughs> Pre-incarnation Holy Trinity. We talked about this in Joshua too. Remember that in our study? We talked about was this a pre-incarnate Jesus? And Melchizedek kind of reminds me of that story too. Does it remind you of that story a bit? That there's just sort of this mysterious appearance of a person, but it's more than a person. In this case, referring to yourself as the Lord makes it look pretty clear that it was God. Some have said it was the Father with two angels. Others have said it was the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We don't know, except it was the Lord in all of his glory. But what was Abraham doing? He was entertaining strangers yeah, who were actually angels, possibly. Yeah. All right, we're going to read another account of a similar incident. But before we do that, does anybody have a comment, or do they want to ask a question? So when, when Moses was on the mountain, and the Lord passed by him, he couldn't even look at him, right? So how is it that they could be there in front of Abraham like that and, and be dealing in, in that way? Good question. We don't know. Unless God had a special revelation to Abraham for his own purposes as the father of the nations. All right, Judges 6, 11 to 24. Great question. I'm sorry. Oh. Yeah. Judges 6, 11 to 24. This is uh, about Gideon. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak at Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abiezrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. But sir, Gideon replied, If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all the wonders our fathers told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us, has put us in the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? But Lord, Gideon asked, How can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least of my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites together. Gideon replied, if now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. Gideon went in, prepared a young goat, and from an ephah of flour he made bread without yeast. Putting the meat in a basket and its broth in a pot, he brought them out and offered them to him under the oak. The angel of the Lord said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on the rock, and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. With the tip of the staff that was in his hand, the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Ah, sovereign Lord! I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid. You are not going to die. <clears throat> so Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day it stands in Ophrah of the Abezrites. Thank you, Ron. So the consistent theme of the angel's message is do not be afraid and the Lord is with you. If you look at the Old Testament and the New, those are constant refrains. Remember Gabriel with Mary, hail favored one, the Lord is with you. Now, we could get pretty bunch into angels tonight and stay here for 40 more minutes easily. We could get into Jacob wrestling with the man and a lot of other stories, but I just wanted us to look at those two as we consider the context and the historical allusions to the idea of strangers, and angels being one and the same visiting people. So for the Hebrew Christians, they're being told to continue with that same faith that the people of old had. In other words, be ready for the supernatural at any time and in any place. And how would that apply to us in terms of our daily life, ministering to strangers? welcoming the sojourner. 
treat people the way you would like to be treated. I don't think you ever know when you have the opportunity to do it. It just appears and you have your choice to go ahead and be kind or be friends to them. Your dad didn't start out saying, oh, I'm going to do this. And all of a sudden, God said, oh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Here's your opportunity to show that you obey me. Right, and as we pray every morning, we can ask the Lord to bring people into our path that we may give them a blessing. And God will. We, we did a very interesting experiment on that. <clears throat> My wife and I were in the Rocky Mountains for a month, several years ago. And each day we got up and said, Lord, bring somebody into our life today that we can bless. And every day for 30 days he did. And it was all different, all different situations. Some a little bizarre, <coughs> and some just very sweet. So, if we ask, he will. That's right. So let's be willing. We have everything we need in Christ to be a blessing to someone else. I thank you for sharing. Verse 3, remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. I don't know if you've noticed this. We didn't spend a lot of time on this, but it's believed that the author was writing from prison. And we'll see a verse a little bit later in this chapter that gives more of that. He also says something about his chains in a previous chapter. That's why some, again, thought this might be Paul. But Paul was not the only person in prison, as we know from the end of this. Timothy was, too, at one time. So just keep that in mind. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated. <coughs> since you yourselves are in the body also. And uh, Ray, if you please read for us 1 Corinthians 12, 26, where Paul talks about what it means to be in step with one another in every circumstance. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. One part is honored, and every part rejoices with it. So you probably can already see the, the practical applications, the ethics, the teaching that's going on here. We've already seen about keeping unity and love with one another, about welcoming strangers, about the supernatural power of what that looks like, about being in league with all those who suffer, including those in prison. And in verse 4, we're going to talk about sexual morality. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Now, that seems pretty clear. Let me read to you one piece of something called the Apostolic Confession which was from the 4th century. It was basically um, more or less a common confession that the Christians agreed to in terms of how they would take care of each other. Uh, in the 4th century, the Apostolic Confession commanded the Christians to go out and redeem slaves, to buy back people from prison, spend their money that they would have spent on their own comfort on freeing people. You know, it's amazing. Many people sold themselves in the early years of Christianity. They sold themselves into slavery to get the money to free another Christian. Hmm. Did you know that? Yeah. Wow. Right. So it'd be like today with human trafficking, if you found a way to basically sell yourself into that system in order to free somebody else. Yeah. But are these verses, are they scoped to like other Christians and, and other people that, or is it meaning like the wider you know, people in general, like Christians. anybody in Christ, anybody in prison, no, or Christians, Christians, yeah. Yes. Joe, was it the norm back then that the prisoners had to have people come feed them, bring them food? It depended on where you were. If you were in a penal colony, there's no access for the most part. Like the salt mines, uh, that was like the worst place to be sent. You'd go blind pretty quickly. That was a death sentence, basically. I don't know the circumstances of each penal colony, but some of them I know you could not visit. Uh, I know like in some countries today, I'm sure you know this, that the family has to bring food and sustenance to people in prison. Yeah, that's a good question. All right, we have some thoughts um, on verse 4 about marriage. You know, why, why marriage? I mean, that's a good question, right? Because today a lot of people are thinking, I don't need to be married. I don't need a piece of paper. I can make family what I want it to be. Well, here's the New Testament standard. Scripture gives three reasons for marriage. One, propagation of children. 
God in Genesis talks about being one flesh and propagating. Jesus affirms that in the New Testament. Replenish the earth. Marriage is not only for the propagation of children, however, it's for the prevention of immorality. There are some people who couldn't stay pure and single. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and every woman her own husband, it says elsewhere in the New Testament. So in other words, get married. Better to get married than to burn, as Paul said. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, it eliminates solitude. God said it is not good for man to be alone. Marriage propagates children, prevents immorality, and eliminates solitude. Not that being alone is a bad thing, but for some people, it's not the ideal for them, and they need to be with someone else. Uh, so those are some thoughts from the scriptures on marriage, just a quick cursory view. Uh, fornication, according to the original word here, means any kind of sexual expression outside of the covenant of heterosexual marriage. Go to verse 5 or some thoughts or questions. Is it also a reflection of Christ and the church and it's supposed to sort of mirror that? Is That That would be Ephesians. Yes, oh, okay. Ephesians spells that out, that it's the image of Christ and the church. And in John's Gospel, Jesus performed his first miracle at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. So that's another scripture that shows that Jesus cared about marriage. Got a quick question. Um, <clears throat> how does that apply to divorce situations? Well, that's a great question. It's a big question, but I'm happy to give a, a brief answer to that based upon the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, it was because of your hardness of heart that Moses gave you a certificate of divorce, meaning it wasn't the ideal thing. It was granted to you, Israelites, out of your hardness of heart, you were getting rid of your wives. Moses allowed it. Uh, but in that context, Jesus reaffirmed the Genesis creation story of marriage, that a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Uh, that's the ideal. Uh, and then Jesus talks about divorce and remarriage. But that's in the context of Jesus raising the bar so high, tied into the Sermon on the Mount, which we've talked about before, which is you realize, I can't meet that standard. Right? Uh, there are different stipulations in terms of what is allowed for divorce? Um, sexual infidelity is one reason for divorce to be allowed. Uh, but it's um, no doubt a, a complicated subject. Uh, but that's the scriptural reference I would give to how God views marriage. Uh, Malachi says, I hate divorce. So divorce is not God's ideal plan. But the fact is, we're broken people, and that's the reality. Where is the redemption story occurring in our lives? That's what we really need to look at. There's forgiveness. There are, there are new opportunities, new covenants created by God in the New Testament church. And divorce and remarriage is part of the grace that we experience. Divorce and remarriage in the Orthodox Church is allowed if the husband and wife do not come together in one spirit. If there's not a spiritual union, then they allow you to divorce and remarry. Well, as, as contexts have changed, the church has wrestled with that and other issues, as you're well aware. Uh, one thing that's important, too, is Paul said, don't be unevenly yoked. So, whomever you marry, the important thing is that, if possible, you're both of one spirit, as you're talking about. Um, if you're not, the prayer is that the believing spouse will stand with the one who's not, hoping that they'll be converted. So we could spend many weeks on that whole topic. And I thank you for bringing that up. I hope that helped a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one thing I would add just briefly, and then we'll go to first five. Uh, women were viewed as property, largely, um, in certain contexts in the ancient world. And so when uh, Moses gave them a certificate of divorce, that, they were being discarded like property. And, and Jesus was elevating the role of women saying don't discard women as property, that the two are one of flesh. <coughs> so it's honoring the dignity of the other person, I think that's paramount here. That's the most important piece of this, is that here are two equal partners called to be one flesh. You know, you know, just, it's, it's an interesting thing, um, what you just said, because I've always felt that, you know, the, the people that uh, were with Jesus, you know, Mary being one of them, you know, it kind of elevated women's status in a lot of ways. He made them equal. And, you know, it's funny how I don't know where it changed because I don't think he used it that way. 
I mean, you know, women in general, just even in, in other faiths, um, were, were equal. I mean, you know, Muhammad's first disciple was his wife, you know, and somehow women have, I don't know why and where that all changed and what happened, but it, it's interesting that Jesus also felt that women were, you know, should be an equal part. I don't, I don't think he felt that they were, were uh, you know, Secondary yeah. citizens, right? right. <coughs> it's interesting. Yeah. And Paul really addresses this issue pretty succinctly in my mind in Ephesians, starting in 520, and the total premise is husbands and wives submit one to another. So everything subsequent to that is anchored on that. So it establishes there's an equity in relationship and in every nature. And then it gives different roles for the husband and the wife. And of course, the husband is given the much more difficult role of basically putting his wife up on a pedestal and raising her up above him. And it's, you don't hear that taught so much, but that's what Paul's saying. And he's then trying to use the analogy of Jesus and the church. Uh, and you, you need to really get the concept of marriage that Paul developed and going all the way back to Genesis where it says a husband shall leave his family and be joined. Well, to me there seems to be an implicit direction by God in certainly in that relation and it started with Adam and Eve. And I'm wondering if underlying much of this is not the intention of God that we come to him looking for a partner in life. Just some thoughts. Yeah. In Ephesians, to take that further, wives submit to your husbands, the husband's supposed to die. Yeah. Be like Christ. So right. submission's not easy to think about, but dying's not easy either. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got the death rule. That's a good way to put it. Right? So think about that. Well, it doesn't say also that the, the husband's supposed to submit to God, to, right. to Jesus, Always. though. She yep. knows where he's anchored, mm -hmm. not to his boss or to whatever, but to submit to God. And she's more than willing to submit to him in that respect. Mutual submission, one to another, exactly. Absolutely. And, you know, divorce or whatever signs of brokenness we've had in our lives, it's important to remember that there's a pre-conversion life we have and there's the post-conversion. And honestly, I think we have to look at them as different lives. Uh, some of us have made mistakes and we've come to faith and so our life is now under the lens of the gospel and the redemption that Christ has called us to in a way that it wasn't before. Kind of like what I said at the beginning that if we try to legislate morality without any kind of conversion we're simply just throwing rules at people which make no sense. Right. If you're a converted person then you're under the grace of God and you're also under a higher standard. So that's a difference. Mm -hmm. that we're sense. supposed to be what a new creation? Right. Doesn't it say that? Somewhere? Absolutely. Yeah. A new creation. In fact, we're going to get to the part about grace soon. Uh, verse 5, and thank you for your, your input. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Uh, to your point about the fact that God is our partner, ultimately. So we, we've dealt with um, marriage. We've dealt with sexual immorality. Uh, people in prison, angels, strangers. Now we're getting into greed, uh, which is something you don't hear a lot about in our culture. I mean, I, I think of, uh, I heard a, a priest once say that um, of all the confessions he's heard, uh, very rarely are there any about covetousness. It's usually other things, sexual sins or other kinds of brokenness. But to say I'm a greedy, you know what, I need to confess, it just doesn't really happen that much in American culture. Uh, we have so much. But we, <laughs> we need to be aware of covetousness, which is envy, which is um, grieving in other people's success and feeling um, success at other people's grief. That's envy. Uh, our Bishop uh, Douglas and uh, the uh, Roman Empire destroyed the church in Europe. Uh, uh, Islam destroyed it in the Middle East and greed destroyed it in the, in the United States. <laughs> Interesting. All right, verse 6. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? 
So understandably, our writer is appealing to scripture, which is the right place to go in all things. Remember when Jesus was tempted, he quoted scripture and scripture only back to the evil one. So here we're dealing with the sin of covetousness and non-satisfaction, trying to be satisfied in things other than God with scripture, which is, again, God's with us. We have everything in Christ. We don't need anything beyond him. All right, we're moving along here at somewhat of a clip just because of our time, but if you have something you want to say, please just push your hand up and we'll stop. Verse 7, remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Um, what's interesting about that verse, I'm going to read the, the actual margin notes on this. Um, in addition to the role of the faithful in chapter 11, the writer reminds the Hebrews of their own faithful leaders within the church. In so doing, he outlines the duties of pastors. Number one, rule. Two, speak the word of God. And three, establish the pattern of faith for the people to follow. And he offers 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 7 as an example. And I'd like Roger to read that, please. The saying is sure, if anyone aspires to the office of bishop, he desires a noble task. Now a bishop must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, temperate, sensible, dignified, hospitable, and an apt teacher. No drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, and no lover of money. He must manage his own household well, keeping his children submissive and respectful in every way. For if a man does not know how to make, manage his own household, how can he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may be puffed up with conceit and fall into condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, or he may fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Thank you, Roger. So that word bishop is sometimes translated overseer. It comes from the Greek word episkopoi, which is where we get the word episcopal from. So uh, it's a bishop or an overseer. But the point is, and this is why uh, I have Roger read it, there's a really high standard for any leader in the church. And we'll talk about that later with James's admonition to those that might teach that they'll be under stricter judgment from God. Uh, so the idea of remember those who will rule over you, well, the idea is servant leadership and being under the authority of God. Those who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. So your leaders in the church should be speaking the word of God to you. A shepherd feeds the flock with the word of God. Nothing else. And then we have the ultimate shepherd. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, verse 8. That's another one of those great scripture verses that I remember hearing about long before I'd even read Hebrews, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What does that mean? Never changes. So there isn't a Jesus of the first century, and there was a Jesus of the Middle Ages, and now there's a Jesus of our time. The landscape changes through which he ministers, but he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It ties into what God said to Moses from the burning bush. I am. Right. Jesus is. It's Jesus is. So verse 9, do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines. For it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. So in this verse, we're seeing the letter tie in some previous themes. Do you remember that one passage about like a ship on moored being adrift? So we're getting that illusion again. Uh, being established by grace as opposed to foods, which involves the sacrificial system, which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. So in other words, the Levitical priesthood and the whole system, remember folks, we're moving away from that. We're now under grace. Now, grace is messy. Grace is not always understood. Grace is amazing. It was much easier to sort of measure and 
understand the sacrifices as they were. Grace is much less easy to measure because it's outflowing over our lives in so many ways. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. All right, we're now going to be delving into the sacrificial system one more time uh, because the author wants to make sure that these Hebrew Christians have really left it behind and have moved to Jesus. So verse 10. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Okay, remember we looked at that. Right? There were different kinds of offerings. There was a scapegoat that was sent out into the wilderness. Right? We won't go back over all that because we've already covered that. Uh, but we get into the really important comparison here in verse 12. Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered where? Outside the gate. One who is unclean, a thing unclean, crucified outside of the city walls. Therefore let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. In other words, yeah, we're going to follow Jesus right outside the camp. We're going to leave the place of the law and enter the place of grace, the space of grace. We're going to bear reproach for his name, proudly. For here we have no continuing city, bless you, but we seek the one to come. So in other words, Jerusalem we've left behind, and all of its symbolism. The wall, the gate, we've walked outside with Jesus. No more Levitical rules are going to apply to us. There will be a price to pay. Security, right? the security within the walls too, right? Physical security. He also stepped out from his people. The walls, the city, were the Jews. And he stepped out to the Gentiles. So it included the world, not just the, the people that were in the city. Right. That's a good insight, right? Now, if you've been living this way your whole life and your ancestors lived this way, you're programmed to think that my sacrifice means faith in God. And they had to unlearn that. And that's what this whole letter's been about. So in verse 15, the idea of sacrifice is brought back. It's like, so you want to have a sacrifice? Well, here's what it is. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So the only sacrifice we can offer is praise. But that's not totally foreign to the Old Testament, because in the Psalms, it talks about a sacrifice of praise. You do not desire burnt offerings but a sacrifice of praise. So it's always been there. Now it's come out in the forefront, fully in Jesus. Verse 16. Oh, you know what? I've gone a little too far. I was going to have Bill Shaw read something based on verse 13. Uh, Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. Bill, if you please read 2 Timothy 3.12. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Let's hear that one more time. It's such good news. <laughs> in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. Remember, Jesus said, in this world you have trouble. Not that you may have trouble, or it could happen. You will. You'll have trouble. But fear not, for I have overcome the world. And the book of Revelation says it's by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony that they overcame. That's the same for us. The blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. What we can say about how amazing God's grace is, that overcomes all evil. But it means we shouldn't be shy about it. We need to share the faith. Be evangelists. In season and out. That's not easy for us. You have everything you need in Christ. It's so important that we give our testimonies because people can't argue with our testimonies. They may not like it, but you can't argue with it. And when we give our testimony, we're basically we're telling them what God, Jesus, has done in our life. And they can accept it or reject it, but they can't refute it. And I see so many Christians who are 
oh, I can't say that to people, or I may hurt their feelings, or uh, it, you know, maybe maybe they'll think poorly of me. And we, we keep encouraging people, just tell people you're witness. They want to hear it. They really do. And certainly in this country, people want to hear the witness of Christians. They want to know we're real and why we're real. Verse 16, but do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. You've probably heard me say that as the offertory sentence now and then. Well, I usually use the King James Version because I have it memorized from uh, the Episcopal Prayer Book as a child, but uh, same idea. Basically, help each other out. God likes it when we help each other out as the body of Christ. That's what that means. Okay, verse 17. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Uh, John Tuthill, would you please read the margin notes on verse 17 for us? Sure, it says rule over you. That part? Yes. See the note on verse 7. Uh, the pastors and elders of the church exercise the very authority of Christ when they preach teach and apply scripture correctly. They serve the church on behalf of Christ and must give him an account of their faithfulness. These may include both secular and spiritual rulers. Even those who do not acknowledge God are nevertheless ordained and used by him. See Romans 13, 1 and 4. Thank you. I thought that was intriguing because I thought this was just pastors. But MacArthur, in his scholarship, has extended it to mean all rulers, which would be consistent with Romans 13. Basically, be subject over you. And that should bring us great peace, because it realizes that even if we get wrapped around the axle over who the latest caucus leader is, it doesn't matter, because God's in control. God is sovereign. We should keep our eyes on Jesus, not any kind of human figure for our hope. That's good news. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> just like in world history, and there have been great leaders and awful leaders, and God has used them all for his sovereign purposes. Because God works all things for good for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. Right? Some are pretty rough, though. Yes. And let's face it, <laughs> some leaders in the church are pretty challenging. You know, it's we're all under God's authority and we have to trust God that Jesus is the head of the church. That as humans make mistakes, we trust that God will work his purposes through that. Even when it doesn't look like it. He's at work. So verse 18, and this is where it really comes down to the practical application. Pray for us. So I would say that to you as a leader. Pray for me. Pray for your leaders. Yes, Dave. That's obey and be submissive in, in as much as they're doing what's right in God's Word teaching God's consistently mind. with God's right. word, right? right. Yeah. So pray for us. Let's talk about the power of prayer for mm -hmm. three minutes. Not that that's enough time, but we'll get started. <clears throat> if anybody wants to share about your prayer life, feel free to. You know, how do you pray, and where do you see prayer affecting things? Because the fact is, prayer <clears throat> does affect things. It really does. Todd, every day for everything. Uh, my dog, for instance, uh, wasn't didn't seem right. She's had some problems in the past, so I, I left this morning and I asked God to please make her well, whatever was bothering her, to eliminate it. And when I went home from lunch today, she seemed a little bit better. And tonight, when I got home, she was her normal spin yeah. by herself, and she was bouncing all over the place. And, and uh, you know, like I had to be the prayer. I didn't do anything else different but but to pray for her to to get better. Mm -hmm. Do that for, for Gretchen also too. She's been sick, so I prayed for her. She seemed to feel better also. So. That's just to this just this morning. That's it. Pray about but it. Pray about ceasing. But it's all the time, every time. If you have a tough situation you're facing, I really encourage you to ask Christ to go ahead of you and deal with it before you get to it. Hmm. Can you repeat that please? If you're having a tough situation you're facing, ask the Lord to go ahead of you right. to deal with it. That you can walk into things he's already prepared ahead of time. It makes a huge difference. That's practical prayer. That gets beyond the formal prayers we offer in church, which are wonderful. But you can ask him to do anything for you. He'll do, he'll do it in his way. 
Uh, but he wants to help us. God's alive through the Spirit, making a difference all the time. Not necessarily what you think it should be. Right. That's why we say, Thy will be done. <laughs> yeah, Thy will be done. <laughs> Even Jesus said that. Right? Yeah. He didn't want the didn't yeah. want to die because it's with sure will. Yeah. Notice the word conscience. Pray for us, for we are confident that we have a good conscience. When you get converted, you get a conscience. Doesn't always feel great compared to back when you were ignorant and you do whatever you wanted. You're given a conscience, and it, it stays with you. But That's that how the Holy Spirit in, works. Doesn't that tie in with like feeling guilty or just getting rid of the guilt? Well, we're told that the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin. Um, part of that is God working with our consciences to say, that's not right, or yes, that's right. It's not always easy to know what to do. When it comes to ethics, there's something called situational ethics, which means ethics that apply to situation by situation, versus another kind of ethics, which is all rule-based. You know, we have to decide ethically how we're going to live. I mean, the individual really does have to ultimately decide what that's going to be. And that's part of what makes Anglicanism very liberating, but it's also also very frustrating. You know, we don't have a, a doctrinal system, uh, one authority figure who has a magisterium who creates all kinds of rules for every situation. We have the individual conscience that's allowed in tandem with scripture. And so we make decisions about our lives as individuals. And as I said, that can be wonderful and at the same time somewhat maddening. But the conscience is at work all the time. In fact, um, it's been said that there are four things that God has put in place to keep evil at bay. One is the human conscience. Two is the family. Three is the church. And four is the state. So the human conscience, the family, the church, and the state. Those are the four things God has put in place on this earth up against evil. Just think about that. I mean, without those four things, evil would would reign apart from God. But I especially urge you to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. So where is he? A prison prophet. He wants to be restored to them. Now, verse 20 is actually the Easter blessing found in the Episcopal Book of Common Prayer. Word for word. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Ooh. Amen. Um, let's see now. Verse 21. Um, let's see. Verse 21. Yes. John Todd Hill. Would you read the margin notes on verse 21? On 21. Make you complete. Uh, make you complete. This is not the Greek word for perfect or perfection used throughout Hebrews to indicate salvation. See the note on 514. But it is a word which is translated prepared in 10.5 and framed in 11.3. It refers to believers being edified. The verb has the idea of equipping by means of adjusting, shaping, mending, restoring, or preparing. See 1 Corinthians 1, 10, 2 Corinthians 13, 11, 2 Timothy 3, 17. Okay. So really, we're at the end of Hebrews, and we're talking about uh, contentment, completion, or satisfaction, which is how God wants us to be with Jesus. And Jesus should complete us, satisfy us, so that, don't, that we don't lust and have greed and are adrift doctrinally. The idea is that Christ is everything, and at the same time, Christ is enough. And I appeal to you, brethren, bear with the word of exhortation. For I have written to you in a few words. I mean, in a few words. I just have to say, that seems funny to me. <laughs> Thirteen weeks together, <laughs> plowing through verses, and those are just a few words. Okay. I, I think it's a little bit of uh, Hebraic humor myself, <laughs> but that's just me. <laughs> know that our brother Timothy has been set free, with whom I shall see you if he comes shortly. So he was in prison with Paul for preaching the gospel, and he's been set free. Greet all those who rule over you. So that's the third time he's talked about being ruled over. And all the saints, 
Those from Italy greet you. Hey, Vito. No. <laughs> Grace be with you all. Amen. So, let's take a deep breath. We did it. All right, some practical questions. I'm going to ask Dave Williams to ask us two questions. The first is question number three on page 124. Let's start with that. How is God's presence an antidote for discontentment? So really, that's why we're here tonight. Um, read the question again. Three or four? Three. 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 How is God's presence an antidote for discontentment? So we've, we've been together for 13 weeks now. <clears throat> I'm very moved that you all have been here so consistently. I mean, I have to be here. I'm the teacher. But you, <laughs> you're here because you've been led to be here. And it's because we all share something, a hunger for the Word of God. We want spiritual contentment. We want to fill the whole of the soul, and only God can do that. So how is God's presence an antidote for discontentment? What are your thoughts on that? Well, if you're discontent, it's because you're wanting something. But what else could we want? We have everything in Christ. So I think it's, I think it's uh, this perspective that you gain that that's a, you're you're provided for, and so where else would we go? So the more we can dwell in, in the fact that we have eternal life, we, we have everything uh, beyond what we could even imagine, that that is the, that does that dispels uh, discontentment completely. The more we dwell on, it. we can't we can't drift away from it. Otherwise, discontent discontent uh, creeps back in. But it puts it into perspective. Also, if you have the presence of the Lord and calmness within you. All the other stuff is just noise. It doesn't really matter. I mean, it matters, but you can handle it. You know you're going to get through it. So. I think when God's present in us, we get at least three things. First thing we get is the peace of Jesus, his shalom, which he promised us. And that overcomes everything of the world. So when all of these things fly at us. If we have this peace, it's like we have Teflon up around it because it just. And then when God's present in our hearts, we have His, his love, which just overcomes everything. And if He's present there, we're supposed to have the joy of the Lord, and that mm -hmm. makes us strong. I'm sure there's a lot more we get, but at least those are three things I can think of. Me personally, it's just what can, how can I be better at everything that I do in every situation? You know, we talk about situational ethics. It's, it's kind of that. That's, you know, for me, that's contentment. Did I handle this situation correctly? Could I have done better? Maybe I'll, if I'm presented in that situation again, you know, I'll be prepared this time and, and be ready to deal with it you know, where I feel that, you know, I'm, I did the right thing. And I can be content that way. I think I can be content. Um, I was just, today I've just been thinking a lot about um, the second chapter of Ephesians. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in. Um, I, I'm just always amazed at how um, it's, I'd say it, it's, it's that simple that when you're in when you're in God's presence and you're present to Him, that is, you're not shutting Him out or whatever. That God is, is working on you, He's working through you, and so the the situations that I find um, that God just has sort of prepared a way beforehand uh, for you to do good, to do good works. Um, he, he takes full responsibility. That. And and and, you can, and that that's for me. You can just say that I, I'm a crazy guy. I had a situation oh, um, week before, uh, the weekend before this last, where I got the word from um, from Kasulu Bible College that their server was down, and um, and in on the internet through Skype chatting, working with the technician there for well, over ten hours mm -hmm. over uh, two different days. Um, we we just couldn't get bypass the, the problem we were having, which I think is a hardware issue with, with a particular 
server. Now this is the computer that runs everything for them. And with all the classes and all the things they have coming up, it would be a tremendous hardship for them to wait for me to come in May. Um, but I, I have to admit, I was at, at the whole time I was working with them, and there was a lot of time in between where I would type them the next instruction that they were to do, and then waiting for them to tell me what the result was, back and forth. Um, it's just a real sense of, of God's presence in all that we were doing, and. Um, so I just said, Lord, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know how. I mean, I, I certainly have the technical skills to, to lead them, but I don't know how this is going to turn out when it's over 8,000 miles away on limited bandwidth for me to work with them. And uh, what, what turned out was I was able to um, uh, purchase new hardware, uh, very small, very powerful hardware, and was able to uh, put that together um, and, and, and completely set up the entire Bible College setup in one evening, and was able to send that hardware to Bishop Micaiah, who just happens to be in the United States right now. <laughs> and, um, and so he's taking it back to Kasulu, and probably in about a week, we're going to get it all hooked up and, and get them back on track. But those, you know, those are God's provisions. Um, I, couldn't, I couldn't have planned on that. I couldn't have possibly uh, just that. You know, I made that happen. Um, it's his timing, and so I, I, I just feel uh, privileged, really, to be able to serve him that way, and to use the, the skills that I have. But to know it's him doing it, it's God doing it. You know, our ordinary in His hands becomes extraordinary, and I, and I, I I'm always, you know, banking on that. That's a great testimony. Thank you. Uh, David, how about reading that last question? You know, it's the last night, so we're going to go to 8.05. <laughs> oh. Or maybe even later. Oh, wow. that's true. So Let's this see. is question number 12 on 127. Uh, describe one concrete way you want your life to be different in the future as a result of this study. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Describe one concrete way you want your life to be different in the future as a result of the study. Let's go around the room, right? You want to start? I love the story of grace. That's when, when you push everything away. The whole book's about the grace of God through Christ. And that's the gospel. And it's right there for everybody to pick up and receive. I just wish we knew who is writing this letter it remains a mystery but he's but he's he's apparently writing from Rome and uh, that because uh, he's he's well he's in Italy anyway he's sending greetings from the Christians in Italy to, uh, and Timothy has been released presumably from prison in Rome. It's interesting. He's not if he if he's close to Timothy, then he can't be far from Paul. Fascinating. You have to add that to your list of questions of God when you get to heaven. <laughs> well, I got a lot, a lot of them. <laughs> Something tells me you and God will have a very good time. <laughs> Well, one thing I personally uh, want to see in my life is how to share the freedom of Christ with others, much like the author was trying to liberate the Hebrews of his time. And he did it through 13 verses as we have broken it up with a lot of references to the Old Testament. 
and our approach would be the same yet different in our context because the people we would reach uh, perhaps don't know the Old Testament and so we have to take a different approach whether it's people who have never been to church or have bad feelings about church but he was writing to people who knew all about church as it were in terms of the system but we're facing a culture uh, that is filled with what are called the nuns which mean they have no religion no interest they're indifferent and that's difficult to reach uh, that population so I would like to find a way to be more effective with God's help in spreading the gospel through evangelism through this church. I'd like to see more people who are nuns come to this church, either by invitation from one of us or simply through the Holy Spirit's leading. And it does happen. It does happen. So pray, pray that the uh, Lord would continue to lead us into the harvest. For the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And prayer is key in all this. That's why Jesus said pray. Any last thoughts before we close with prayer? Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 I, I appreciate coming here. Uh, when, when I do get a uh, chance to make it, this, this session has been pretty good. But just hearing the feedback and, and really the testimony from others, it's, so it's, it's a blessing, you know? So thanks, everybody. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. I think that's probably the, the the contentment that I get is, is is listening. I mean, I've already accepted the fact that I'm stupid, and uh, I'm a spiritual <laughs> retard, and uh, I need a lot of input. And, uh, and it's really nice to sit and listen, and to, to try to process it. I've come to the, come to the realization that I'm not going to know an awful lot about the Christian faith. Or about faith in general, and uh, and uh, I know that you try to do it without Jesus. That's stupid, and I'm not doing that anymore. <laughs> so, uh, uh, it's, um, uh, I uh, uh, I had uh, lunch last Monday with the Bishop of New York. Now there's a stupid guy. <laughs> He's trying to do it without Jesus. At least. When I was talking to him, it, it, that's what it seemed like. And, uh, I, uh, I guess grace uh, kind of hit me a year or so ago, two years ago, an unreserved, undeserved favor of God. I don't deserve it. I don't. I shouldn't be having it, but He dumps it on me. I have God's grace, and, uh, and, he, and He wants me to have not to do anything for it. I don't have to be good enough for it. I don't. But I, but I want to try to live the kind of life that we're that we're talking about. But I, uh, I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to be successful. I'm not going to worry about it because God's grace is going to comfort for me anyway. I don't know. I, I don't know if that explains it. But uh, but I do find uh, contentment in it, and I really do feel like I don't deserve anything that I have, and even. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm thankful that I can come to church here. If, if I didn't go to church here and I wanted to stay Anglican or Episcopalian, where would I go? I'd have to drive to Grace Church, Joel Saybrook, uh, Tara Phil, uh, Darian. Uh, there's no other gospel preaching Episcopal church uh, in a reasonable distance of here. So, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that you don't kick me out of here because the, 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 the diocese doesn't want retired clergy going to their own church. So, uh, it's, uh, uh, well, Andrew broke, broke the pattern anyway. He, he asked me to come back, but I couldn't be here while he was there. So I... Uh, I well, we I, will stay in the Word of God together and grow in faith together. And doctrine precedes behavior. That's one thing we've learned from the letter to the Hebrews, that we have to understand what it means to follow our Lord. And that's where the behavior stems from. And it's been said that, you know, Jesus didn't come to make bad men good. He came to make dead men alive. And that's what the Word of God does for us. So let us pray. Lord, raise us to new life. As your living Word, 
sharper than a two-edged sword, and able to cut through bone and marrow, transforms us. You, Jesus, are the living word, and we ask you to guide us home and prepare us for the next study after Easter on the Gospel of Mark. And may we grow in our knowledge and love of you, and may we know that deep contentment that only you can give. In your name we pray.